Hi, this is Bob Scully and welcome to another edition of The World Show, our Hidden Angels series. That's the name we've decided to give to a number of shows devoted to special needs children. And we're doing this, of course, as a tribute to the Hidden Angel Foundation, foundation in Alabama and all over the world, devoted to providing multisensory environments for special needs children, started by Sandra Forns and Bud Kirchner. And uh, while we were working on that documentary that we're, uh, that we're preparing on the Hidden Angel Foundation, we met some hidden angels. We met some remarkable people in Alabama who have that marvelous sixth sense where special needs children are concerned. They can get them to talk, express themselves. They can bring out that great sense of humor and they do it with their own sense of humor and their own sense of humanity. Here then, this week, is Dr. Jan Rao, professor of occupational therapy at the University of Alabama with her story. Dr. Rao, I think uh, uh, medicine and uh, all the health sciences can be rather proud uh, of the advances made in our treatment of, of children in pediatrics over the years. There was a time, uh, I mean, you, you read these horror stories in the 19th century where children were just seen as a nuisance and little adults, and when they had an illness to go with that, it was even worse. Um, but but uh, from where you sit, how has pediatrics evolved these past few years? Well, there's been substantial change with regard to occupational therapy in the medical field. Um, I was first I became an occupational therapist in 1982 and moved to Alabama in 1983. Um, I've worked with many populations, but the majority of my um, practice has been in pediatrics. And um, but I, you know, I have to say, as late as the 1990s, mm -hmm. 95, 96. We still had physicians in this town, in this state, and even in this country who were advising parents to institutionalize their children, um, which is incredulous when you think about it. Mm -hmm. um, it. You know, while we've grown a lot and we now have policies in, in place for children with disabilities to receive services from birth to three years of age, um, from three years to 21 years of age, we, w there's been tremendous growth, but at the same time, we still have a long way to go. Um, we have children now who are being educated that have, um, you know, that back before 1975 didn't have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, but we still have a long way to go for our young adults um, uh, because once they turn 21, there's really not any service in place for them at that point. So um, occupational therapy, like all of the other medical professions, we've made um, great strides, but we still have work to do in that area. And when, when children are um, disabled mm -hmm. and have a difficulty communicating, or perhaps uh, less intellectual development, um, is it still a truism that other children will taunt them and that they have trouble accepting them, or is that an exaggeration? Um, I, you know, I think it's probably a little bit of both. Um, I do some independent evaluations for the state of Alabama um, for the educational system. And unfortunately, I get called in when parents are not happy with the services that their children are getting. So I go in as an objective um, reviewer and review the system and the services that the child is getting and then make recommendations for them. And what I've found, I've been doing this for about 15 years as part of my role as a faculty member. And what I've seen over the years is that um, children are uh, children of all ages and all abilities are much more welcoming now of children with disabilities mm. because it's kind of commonplace. You know, it, they're used to seeing the kids with disabilities in their school. Um, well, you know, when I was in high school, we only saw those kids with disabilities at lunch or you only saw them if there was some type of um, auditorium presentation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, now kids are pretty used to seeing them at all times of day, every single day of the week. That said, there still is a lot of bullying. There oh. still is a lot of um, kind of taunting, especially if children with disabilities have a certain level of ability and they're more included in the regular classrooms. They, can, they don't, don't, can't quite keep up. Exactly. And so they may not have the um, judgment to know if you know there's a group of um, guys or a group of girls who are wanting them to um, do something that might be kind of silly and get in trouble. They may not have the judgment not to do that. Um, and so to be liked and to be included with that group of typical kids, mm -hmm. they would go ahead and, and perform the, the action or the behavior. And institutionalization that cuts them off from family, everybody agrees that's bad. Right. Um, but as for, um, uh, let's say, uh, daytime institutionalization mm -hmm. versus being plunged in the general population of a school, uh, where does that stand? What's considered better? 
Uh, well, that's the million dollar question. Um, inclusion or some type of bridge between inclusion and more segregated services. Um, you know, parents in this country now are firm believers that their children need to be included. Mm -hmm. um, they need to be included with their peers. They need to have the same overall educational opportunities as everybody else. I tell my OT students all the time that it's not just about the child learning how to read and write and hold their pencil correctly. It's that entire educational experience. So for instance, I saw a young woman um, several years ago who was 19 years of age, had a year left in high school um, before she graduated. She um, was a gifted student in the gifted program, had um, a spinal cord injury. And in order for her to um, continue to be with the gifted program, she had to have someone with her because she didn't know how to self-catheterize herself. So oh. she had to have an adult with her that was trained that could catheterize her um, if they went away for trips with the gifted program. Well, it became a real hardship, and so she actually had to drop out of the gifted program simply because she had never hmm. been taught to self-catheterize. Which, I mean, which, those, and she probably could have done it. She could have done it. She had the intellectual ability. She had the physical fine motor skills to do it. She just didn't know, and her mother didn't know. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not just about being in the classroom with other children, but you need the, you know, the field trips and the, the girls' bathroom. I mean, there's a whole education in going to the girls' bathroom. You, mm -hmm. know, you learn to cuss and smoke and everything else in the girls' bathroom, or the boys' bathroom, for that matter. So, um, you know, it's about that entire experience. And so if children only know other children with disabilities, and, and some of those children are verbal and some are not, but they're never around typical peers, they don't learn from that experience. And do we still try to prepare as many of them as we can for some kind of employment? Or is that, because I've heard sometimes that can go really wrong. I right. mean, you can push them too hard. Right. Um, or at the same time, sometimes you don't push them hard enough, or you don't push employers hard enough to make the effort. Right. Well, with the new, um, the latest um, amendment to the um, IDEA legislation, um, there's actually a transition service built into that piece of legislation. And so all transition services for children with an IEP has to start by the age of 16. What's IEP? An IEP is an individualized educational plan. Okay. And so children who have, um, that are, um, eligible for special education all have an IEP. And so you can make recommendations for that child to begin to have transition services at the age of 16. But for some children, they're going to need a lot more practice, they're going to need a lot more rehearsal in order to become competent in those transition skills. And what I mean by that are things like independent living skills. Mm -hmm. So learning how to cook for themselves, learning how to do their own wash, learning how to um, maybe um, write a check or you know manage money. Um, so those are the skills that we look at starting about 16 years of age to get them ready for some type of employment. Not all children can go on then to become independently employed mm -hmm. and to be, you know, earning money, but they might be in some type of job supported program where they have a, a job coach that can be with them and maybe cue them. Um, if they start to get too anxious, maybe that person has some cueing systems that can allow them to kind of back off from the situation, get under control, take a break, um, walk around for a few minutes, and then come back and finish their job. And to 